Hello, my name is Andre Ward, and I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy. Welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the legal system from various perspectives, including people most impacted by the criminal legal system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with, criminal, with social justice, and highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone that is affected by it. We ask you, the viewers, to spread the word about both sides of the bars and share comments with us on Twitter at the Fortune SOC. So today we have a really lively discussion and also a really interesting topic that we want to discuss um, as it relates to criminal legal reform issues in New York State, but more broadly, obviously nationally. Um, we're talking about today is um, parole, technical parole violations. And today I have several guests with us um, from different organizations that are working on um, ending uh, the kind of parole and probation practices that negatively impact people um, that have some criminal legal history in some way and on parole and probation. Um, currently, um, you know, we talk about in New York State, and I'm sure this applies nationally as well, there are more people that are reincarcerated for technical parole violations, um, which could be um, a curfew, like not coming in um, at a certain time, or if your curfew is at 10 o'clock, you come in at five after 10, you're violated for parole, which is considered a technical parole violation. Someone um, not calling their parole officer, someone may have some issues with alcohol use, uh, which is more of, where treatment is needed rather than incarceration. All these things are associated with technical parole violations. And it's something that needs to be addressed. Currently, New York State in particular, um, reincarcerates more people for technical parole violations than any state in the country, except for Chicago, Illinois. And I'll say that again, New York State reincarcerates more people for technical parole violations than any other state in the nation, except Illinois. And this is something that has been a huge issue and something that advocates, um, some of whom are on this call, have been lifting up and amplifying um, all for all so much so long to make sure that this has changed. Um, some other data to look at too, when we talk about these parole violations, right? In New York State, um, there were six, in 2016, 6,300 people were sent back um, to prison for technical parole violations. Um, and of that 6,300 or so, like it was like, it represents like 65% of the New York state population. That's a lot of people, just a lot of people that are returned back to prison for technical parole violations. And of those, uh, that 65%, only 14 of them had new offenses. So clearly there is a challenge with the parole system and probation system and it's broken. So today I have joined with me some leaders um, from various organizations. I have um, Emily Napier, who is from the organization Unchanged. I have Donna Hilton, who is from uh, A Little Piece of Light. She serves as the CEO and, exec and the executive director there. Um, Emily serves in the executive capacity uh, uh, there at Unchained. And then I have Della Smith, who has also joined us from the Catal uh, Center for Health, Equity, and Justice. Uh, leaders, colleagues, thank you for so much for joining us here at both sides of the bars. How is everyone feeling today? Fine, thank you. So I want to get right into it. I want to get right into it, right? Kind of hear like about each, what each of your organizations do. And then we want to segue into the work that each of your organizations are doing around ending these kind of parole practices that are negatively impacting people in New York State, but also impacts people nationally. And I'll start with you, Emily. Talk to us about like Unchained. What does it do um, and your role in work in it? Yeah, thanks, Andre. It's great to be here, especially with uh, my esteemed colleagues, Donna and Della. Uh, so Unchained is an organization that's based up in Syracuse, New York. Um, so we're about four hours north of New York City, right in the middle of New York State. Um, and we have a mission to... Uh, broadly dismantle the carceral state. So that's all these different um, facets of our criminal legal 
system, you know, from policing all the way to parole when people come home from prison, right? The whole spectrum of the carceral state. Um, what's unique about Unchained, in addition to being based in upstate New York, is that we are co-led by myself and my husband, Derek Singletary, who is currently in state prison. And we lead the organization together with him on the inside and me out here um, because we you know, just have a fundamental belief that the people who have survived and are surviving the system are the ones who know best um, what the problems are and what we need to do to address that. Um, you know, we have um, a lot of formerly incarcerated people leading in the movement now, which has been a major shift over the past um, couple of decades, which is a huge uh, important shift to have taken on in the movement. Um, but what we're really trying to do is bring currently incarcerated people into this movement as well, um, which as you can imagine is difficult to do. There's a lot of logistical challenges with that. Um, and I know Donna <laughs> can speak to all of that as well um, in terms of what a little piece of light is doing. Um, so that's broadly what we do at Unchained and we co-lead this uh, less is more campaign to overhaul the way parole functions with a little piece of light and with Catal. And we wanna get into that too, right? This campaign, right? on less is more, I want to get into the weeds with that a little bit. I want to shift, uh, obviously, to you, Donna Hilton, um, the work that you're doing now, right? You've been around for many, many years doing this work. Now you are heading um, a little piece of light. Talk to our listening audience about what is a little piece of light. Oh, hi, everyone. Thanks again for um, having this conversation with us, Andre. So a little piece of light, a little piece of light was created out of my walk and the walk of so many other women and, and girls who have been impacted by the um, criminal legal system, abuse, violence, and trauma. So our primary focus are women and, and, and girls who have been impacted by those things. And so we know the vast majority of women and girls, let's say, in the system, in the criminal legal system who are incarcerated, have that in their, you know, that is usually a significant factor into what led them into prison in some capacity right, or just form their, their life. And so, uh, so that's that. So the work that, again, like what uh, Emily was saying, um, that a little piece of light is um, co-leading the Less Is More campaign. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do was uh, focus on pregnant women during this time of COVID, right, and get, uh, get some stuff done around that, right? We were instrumental in getting seven women out of um, the system during this time. Unfortunately, one went back, right? And that one went back because it was a technical violation. Because unfortunately, this young woman, has, it has a substance abuse issue. And so there are no, there are, there's nothing else to respond to it. There's no other way to um, respond to her issues and her illness. It's, you know, it's a disease. Right, but to incarcerate it. And so this is what we are seeing across the board. And to your point, um, just during this time, the governor had told the world that they were going to release around roughly 1,100 people who fell under that category, right? Basically of being parole on parole or whatever. And I think we got like 700 and change, 740 something that were released. Out of that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, but I believe that out of that, 400 and almost 500 went back for mm -hmm. technical violations. So again, the, this, this argument, this campaign is very important because we see not just during this time of COVID, but this is what's really brought it to light, right? The um, cruel nature of parole itself, where you have people that are not committing crimes and they might not have any other issues, but they're poor. <laughs> That's great. Poor, poverty is a crime, right? Um, mental health, drug addiction, or whatever. You know, there are many hurdles that those of us who have been on parole, on parole, face. And so you reincarcerate it. You reincarcerate the person, but you don't put any, you know, you don't utilize whatever systems might be in place or create any systems, you know, to, to address that. 
And so this is some of the work that we focus on with a little piece of light. And we come from it from the aspect of women. And we are fortunate enough to have some women on the inside who help with this in the leadership capacity as well. We're doing a decades worth of time, you know, and understand the system from the inside, like obviously I do, but also who have been reincarcerated because of these issues, not crimes. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, Donna, you speak of that, right? You can't, like, in, our country can't incarcerate themselves out of, like, addressing substance use or alcohol uh, use issues, right? You can't do a mental health issue. You can't just put people away and think that's going to go away, right? There has to be something else in place. And so that's a good point you raised. And obviously being able to respond to the needs of women who are incarcerated and also have had the experience of technical violations is something obviously that's really important a little piece of light is doing. And it's timely because especially this is like uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month as well, right? I think it's also like critical in that work. And I want to shift to um, Della now. And Della obviously is a representative at the Catal Center for Health, Equity and Justice. And Della, talk to our listening audience about the work that you're doing there uh, with Catal mm -hmm. and what it does. And then we're going to circle back into uh, this campaign on Less Is More. Stella, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. Well, I am a member of Catal, and Catal is a community-based organization, and we have three main goals. Our first goal, we want to end mass incarceration and mass criminalization and the war on drugs. And our second goal is developing leadership and the organiz organizing capacity of our neighborhood residents and to drive about change because we want change in our communities. And the third uh, goal of the organization is advancing evidence-based solutions to achieve healthier, safer, and more equitable communities for all of our residents. And we achieve our goals through community organizing as a practice. Uh, to the point, uh, I got involved with Catal based on someone coming to a senior center. So as a senior, you're never too late to become educated and as you know, uh, education is knowledge and power. So that's how I got involved with, with Qatar. And I'm proud to be a member for these past two years because it is self-evident that if we give people the tools and the information that they need, that hopefully we can do better and bring about the positive changes that we wanna see throughout our community and for all of our residents. Absolutely, and thank you for that, Della, too. And you know, we're talking about um, this issue of technical parole violations and the need to overhaul that kind of practice. Um, this is just not state, obviously, based, right, issue. This issue has national implications, right? So whatever state you're in, right, if you're from New York all the way to Florida, right, each state, obviously, although it's its own fiefdom to some degree, has the same mechanisms, right, in dealing with people on parole. And if there are 2.3 million people approximately that are incarcerated, We've had some just involvement in this country, right? We would say close to maybe like over 500,000 or so are under some kind of community supervision or so. And that obviously has to be changed, which leads me to talk to you, Emily, now. The Less Is More campaign, explain to our listening audience, what is that? What is the Less Is More campaign? What does it seek to do? Sure. So our organizations um, drafted this bill with input from currently and formerly incarcerated people, people who are on parole, family members of people who are on parole. Um, and we put together a bill that would do three main things, really. So the first thing is that it would, um, for most technical violations, eliminate incarceration as a sanction. So you would not go back to jail for those technical violations that you talked about at the beginning, Andre, those things like curfew, um, not calling your parole officer, uh, an addiction issue, things that are not crimes, right? They're just part of the conditions that parole puts on you. Um, there are a few um, of those technical violations uh, under the bill that could potentially still result in incarceration, but it would never be for more than 30 days at a time. Whereas right now, it's very common for people to get a year or even a two year hit on a 
parole violation. And what I mean by that is they go back to jail, back to state prison for a year or even two years. Um, and that's happening routinely. Under less is more, it would be no more than 30 days. Um, the second thing that the bill does is it really changes the whole process of being accused of a technical violation. And it gives people um, much stronger due process rights. So right now, if your parole officer accuses you of a parole violation, what happens is they just handcuff you right then and there. It might be at your house. It might be at the parole office when you go in to report to your PO. They handcuff you right then and there and take you directly to jail. You do not get an arraignment in front of a judge like you do um, if you're accused of a regular crime. Um, there's no opportunity for bail. You just sit in jail um, while your hearings are pending, which can take uh, up to 90 days and sometimes even longer, depending on if the state is dragging their feet. Um, and at no point during those 90 days do you have an opportunity for bail or ROR or anything like that, like you would if you were accused of an actual crime. So under less is more, that practice would stop. If you're accused of a technical parole violation, what you would be issued what we call a notice of violation, which is essentially an appearance ticket telling you to show up to court for a hearing on this accusation of this violation. No more going to jail automatically and having your life disrupted for up to three months. Not just know. disrupted, Emily, but also put at extreme risk especially during COVID. During COVID, absolutely. You know, we're talking about um, an accusation of a non-criminal behavior that could turn into a death sentence. That's a very real possibility at this moment that we're living in. Um, and, you know, for example, the first two people to die from COVID that they contracted at Rikers Island were there for technical violations of parole. So we saw that become a horrific reality that these two gentlemen were at Rikers Island for things that were not even crimes and ended up dying as a result because of this pandemic. We have to put a stop to that. It's just, it's, it's an absurd practice even in normal times and it's a deadly practice in this moment that we're living in right now. Um, and then very quickly, the third thing that the bill would do is it establishes this concept of earned time credits, um, which some people call the 30 for 30. Um, and essentially that means if you are violation free for 30 days, you receive 30 days off your time under supervision. So you can essentially cut your time on parole in half uh, if you remain violation free and we can get people out from under this surveillance apparatus that they are subjected to so that they can move on with their lives um, safely and productively. You know, and that's interesting, Emily, that you bring this up, um, this 30-30 rule. It's almost like, you know, the more time you spend, the less time you have to do on parole, right? It'll actually be off at some point. I'm made to reflect on an article I just read about a, a Michigan governor who has just signed into legislation the Clean Slate Act, which will obviously allow people to uh, sentences. If you have a felony, it can be expunged after like 10 years. Um, if you have misdemeanors, those things will be expunged, which is really interesting. I'll get that article to you. But it's a Michigan governor that just signed legislation into law called the Clean Slate, uh, Clean Slate Bills um, just Monday. But Don, I wanna get to you, right? As someone who is a leader in the space, uh, leading an organization that's spoken specifically with women, how important was it that uh, people uh, who've had justice involvement and formerly incarcerated inform the bill mm -hmm. around less is more? Yeah, thanks for that. So I just wanted to say something to what you just said as well. I, as a, as a person who has life on the back of my sentence, so that means I've served life, um, had an opportunity to get off of parole within a certain amount of time, because there's a provision for that. But those of my peers who do not have life on the back of their sentence have no provisions at all, right? 
And so I think we need to be clear about that. Like people who don't have life are still on parole and I who had life and came out after they've been out, there's quite a few are still on parole, right? And so this is one thing that we wanna address with this, what less is more. And so to answer your question, um, why is it important? It's important for, for our voices. It's our, un we understand it, it's our walk, right? right? I mean, we have so many other people who take our stories and use it for whatever research or whatever it is, but then it's third party, fourth party, if it will have many other parties, right? And so it gets lost. The, um, the actual, I mean, it, it, it becomes less tangible, right? You have to hear it from us. It has to take a person who's walked the walk to tell you what it's like, what it feels like, what it smells like, what happens. What, what happens after the cuffs come off? Not many people outside of us can respond to that. You know what I mean? What's the procedure? Like we all remember said it off, right? What's the procedure when there's a gun to you? So what's the procedure after the cuffs are off? What's the procedure after when you are facing, you know, uh, uh, your, what's the ALS hearing, right? And so to not be violated, you know, what happens or what doesn't happen? Those things that need to be in place that are probably not in place, haven't been, because there are no checks and balances within the parole situation, you know, parole system. There just aren't any checks and balances. This is like just free reign, like what we see right now. We have so many institutions that have been created that have no oversight. And so they do whatever they want to do and do it to whoever they want to do it to. And that's why you see a large population of black people and black and brown people, let's be clear. There's really no brown people, black people, right? In the system, they know daggone well who they want to target. As much as we hate that word, but we're targets. And who they want, you know, who they want to um, criminalize. It starts, we look at the school to prison pipeline, foster care to prison, but we see so many things. There have been so many things created, right? So to, to criminalize and to penalize and to just incarcerate whole communities of people. And this is just another way, an extension of it. When does it end? When does it end? So you have to hear our, you have to hear our walk, you have to hear our journey and experience with this to understand. So that's why it's very important, very important. We can't miss anything here. We can't. Our you know, lives really, are really going to You know, it's interesting too, you bring it up, Donna, because I mean, when we're talking about this idea of parole, technical parole violation, right? The decisions are obviously arbitrary and capricious, right? And almost mirrors like, the parole hearing process, right? When they make the decision to release you or not, it's arbitrary and capricious. And much of the decision is based on the nature of your crime, right? If the nature of the crime never changes, but they continue to give you these additional time to serve. Almost like with parole, you're released from prison, you're on parole, they're pulling from like historical stuff and then developing and criteria for you to like remain under supervision based on some historical stuff that happened 20 years ago, right? Like, oh, like you shouldn't be outside because your crime act that happened in the daytime, hypothetically. Right? But just these arbitrary and capricious decisions that are made, that's there's like a relationship between that parole and the parole hearing. But itself. they also make up stuff, and it's been in my experience, they also make up stuff in the moment. There's one woman I know I met when I was working uh, with Exodus and doing stuff, working with parole. And I saw this woman who's been out of prison many years before I got out and she was at parole. And so I was, you know, I talked to her and then she said her parole officer who, you know, you go through so many, he's pushing her date of release off of parole back and back and back because they're not, they're not satisfied with her mental health um, uh, treatment basically what she's taking she should be taking some i mean like wh where do you draw the line at mm -hmm. you're keeping this woman in the system wasting money wasting time knowing full well that is not even your responsibility that has nothing to do with you and because you don't like it i just had somebody i have to say this is so important I have somebody that i kind of our organization helped save from going back to prison by giving her a job right because she's on work release the, the, the counsel for work release, because it's so important because parole officers do the same thing in the same mindset, mm -hmm. said to her, and then she got that other job, oh, you're just making a little less than I am with a nasty attitude, pissed mm -hmm. off because that woman is making almost as much money as she is and she's on basically parole. You get what mm -hmm. I'm saying? But you sure. want to violate her 
because you're angry about that. That really happens. Yeah, I know it's so many cases like that. And so I want to shift to Della, right? Obviously with Katal, Center for Health, Equity and Justice, have taken on this campaign in partnership with the Little Piece of Light and Unchained. Um, talk a little bit about like some of the, uh, like the focuses. Katal is, is obviously like pushing this really hard um, in collaboration and co-partnership with others that are on this call. Um, but talk about some of the other things that Katal is doing relative to some of this um, less is more work as well. Okay, well, uh, Katal is on the executive committee and we have been pushing less is more New York, both locally and statewide. Locally, we have had meetings with community groups such as the Van Dyke Two Senior Center and with groups that work with people who are on parole and we let people know how this bill would impact them. And this is uh, where I come in because as a grandmother, I'm raising a nine-year-old of my son who's incarcerated and I would like to see light at the end of the tunnel. And if you keep putting, you know, our young people or, or these incarcerated individuals back into the system, you say, well, what is happening to families? What is happening to other grandparents such as myself? You know, it's a, it's a big task and we want to give them a fair chance at getting back out here with their families, raising their children, doing the things that any person who care about anything would want to do and not be something hanging over their head because of a mistake that they made early on and they paid their dues. But we have had uh, various information sessions to call attention to Less Is More in New York. We've also, I've, as I said, uh, I've reached out personally to other grandparents in the various meetings that I attend. Now we're doing it virtually, you know, but I am a member of the Tompkins Houses Senior Group and that's where I got a chance to meet a young man who was uh, an apprentice uh, with, with Katal and uh, shared a lot of information. And my heart was with him because I know that this happens to so many individuals and the families that are impacted by this. Also, Grandmother's Love, another group where many grandparents are again, raising grandchildren. And, and many of them have incarcerated family members and so we're all impacted by it. Also the Brooklyn wide interagency council on aging. Uh, we meet monthly again. So, you know, we're trying to reach out whatever channels we can. And at the state level, we have met with legislators on the issue to ensure that they know of the necessity overdue bill mm -hmm. and uh, co-sponsor the bill. And at Qatar, we have been also advancing the campaign again, as I said, locally and statewide to ensure that people in various communities have the tools to make change on the state level, you know? And it, it's just crucial getting the word out to all of us, not just those of us who have family members, but everyone is impacted by what's happening with this parole reform. You know, a lot of injustices and we need to right this wrong. Absolutely, Della. And just like shifting to you, Emily, right? We know that when a person is reincarcerated owing to a technical violation of parole, it completely disrupts their life, right? And so talk to us a little bit about that, Emily, right? Because here it is, there's obviously prescriptive criteria upon release, right? Maintain steady employment, maintain like housing, all those kind of things. Yet when you violate someone for technical parole violate a technical a violation for something like a, a missing curfew by five minutes, you completely do the very thing that you not that you were trying to you go against the very thing that you're supposed to do. Right? Talk to us a little bit about that, Emily, as we move toward wrapping. Unfortunately, this show up at some point. Talk to us, Emily. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's something that my husband Derek talks about a lot, having been on parole in the past. Um, that you know, you're just really in this sort of catch-22 with all these conditions. Um, and so I'll, you know, to answer the question, I guess I'll share a story of one of our members at Unchained um, who was reincarcerated during the COVID outbreak um, for a technical violation. And so, and it was because he uh, could not make it to his parole appointments because they conflicted with his job. Right. And his uh, first parole officer was accommodating of that and rescheduled things, met him at different times, allowed him to check in by phone. Then he got assigned a new parole officer and that PO 
would not make those same accommodations. And so this young man was forced to choose between, am I going to go to my job, which is a condition of parole, and support my children, which is a condition of parole, or am I going to go meet my PO, which is also a condition of parole, right? It was a no-win situation, and he ended up reincarcerated because of that, and because um, his family lost his income and lost his presence in the family to help with the child care and those kinds of things, his fiance was forced to move to a smaller apartment. She couldn't afford the apartment that she was in anymore. Um, they had a newborn baby who now was separated from her father for several months while he went back to prison on this parole violation. And then when he comes home, he has to start all over again. That job is not going to be there waiting for him anymore. And we know how fragile employment, housing, all of these things are for formerly incarcerated people because of all these barriers we've erected. And so you're taking somebody who's doing well with a job, supporting his family, contributing to his community, and disrupting all of that, not just for him as an individual, but as Della said, for his family too, right? And we can't forget about those implications on uh, children and other loved ones uh, in our communities. So, I mean, it really is just, it, it's not only not serving any public safety purpose, it's actually setting people, families, and communities back a step rather than helping them move forward, which is what we should be doing when people come home. Um, I want to segue to you, Donna, because for women who have been violated owing to technical parole violations, they have specific, unique set of like circumstances that, that their lives are negatively impacted, right? Once they're put back in. Because oftentimes um, the women are mothers and are the primary caregiver of the child. Talk to us a little bit about from that perspective and frame for the women who are put back into prison based on the technical parole violation. Yeah, that's so important. So, you know, one of the things, first of all, we have to look at the woman was already incarcerated in prison, right? And so that means that she's probably coming out for the most part, not everyone, but now having to like reunite, you know, reunificate, reun reunify her family. Right, so that means a lot of things. Some women still can't find their child or children in the system. Some people's children are with a friend or a relative who doesn't want to give the child back. So she has to, these men mandates on her parole stipulation that she has to do for all these things. You know, I mean, it comes to so much, right? They give you these set of mandates. Most of them are boilerplate for everyone. Some are just unique to the person. And then, so she's working on that. She's doing what she has to do. And then whatever speed bump I say happens, because we're always transitioning, right? When we got, we're always transitioning, especially when we have all these crazy egregious um, conditions that we have to um, try to adhere to or, you know, fulfill or whatever. And so she's working on that. And then you want to violate her. She missed curfew by five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever, just in New York, wherever it's at, it doesn't matter, but come on. So now you, you, you send her back and she's detained on Rikers Island. She's going through that. So whatever steps she's made, if she was even given the opportunity to make any, are now wiped away. And so what, what happens to the child, the children, you know, that family dynamic? And what happens to the woman? We don't Absolutely. think, you know, they don't consider these things. It's not that simple. It's not that simple doing this parole dance, right? Because you have to walk on eggshells. And depending who the parole officer is, if they had their coffee, they had a smoke break, if there's nothing going on within their personal space, because I mean, they're human. We all, we, we all react to our stuff, you know, what's going on in our lives, right? And so depending on those factors and so many others is what will happen to the person that day. That's not cool. You got, we have to have some systems in place to like prevent that. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for that too, Don. And you know, in our closing moments, unfortunately, um, how can people get in contact with each of your organizations, support the Less Is More 
uh, campaign. I'll start with you, Della. How can people get in contact with, with, with Katal um, and what can they do to support the Let's Is More campaign? Well, they can certainly support us by spreading the word. Uh, many of us within our communities, we know of people who have children, spouses, sisters, brothers, relatives that are impacted by parole. And so we need to get the message out to them, uh, inviting them out to the meetings where they can join in and become uh, well-informed and organized so that uh, we can fight this fight together to bring about this change. But um, in terms of contacting the organization, they can uh, contact us. It's at uh, katalcenter.org. Mm -hmm. uh, they can get information at the katalcenter.org. And also we have a phone number, 646-875-8822. And um, we just want to make sure that all of our citizens are represented because too often with the disparities, so many of us were missing the mark and we just wanna make sure that all of us are doing our part to get the information out, um, mm -hmm. whatever is needed to help many of the families, many of the parolees, that's, that's our mission. You know, it takes a village. All of us have to do this for the sake of the survival of all of our communities, Absolutely. not just for some of us, but for all of us. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, Emily, obviously, how can people get in, in contact with Unchained? How can they support the campaign? Thanks, yeah, so we, our website at Unchained is www.weareunchained.org um, and we're on social media at Unchained Now. Um, and I'll also mention that the campaign itself has a website, which is www.lessismoreny dot org and why like new york um so if you go to www.lessismoreny.org you'll find all kinds of resources like fact sheets um press releases you'll find a tool to contact legislators and tell them you support the bill um, and you'll also find ways to get in contact with all of us on that website and that website also could be used nationally so if you access the new york state's this website that's in, based here in New York State, you can use elements of that, obviously, in consulting with folk on this call um, to see how you can replicate that kind of campaign in different states because parole and technical parole violation is a national problem, not just a state problem, it's a national problem. In the closing, uh, Donna, how can folk get in contact with uh, Less Is More? I mean, A Little Piece of Light. <laughs> it uh, right. starts with an L, like Less Is More. <laughs> Well, just life. like Emily so you could see you could see the um, campaign uh, co-leaders on um, the Qatar website, but also mm -hmm. they could reach out to um, our website, a, a little piece of light .net. I think it's still .net right now, a little piece mm -hmm. of light .net. We also are on Instagram, uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and Donna Hilton. So you could just it's easy to find us, and we have our opening, grand opening of our office in Brooklyn coming up Friday, this Friday, and so everyone here is invited, right? And so, um, yeah, we're grand opening is from two to six, and so we'll be having, we'll have that space in Brooklyn, and all are welcome. Donna, Della, Emily, thank you so much for joining us today here at the Both Sides of the Bars. My name is Andre Ward. On behalf of the Fortune Society, we thank all of you as viewers from each state, each city, for joining us here at both sides of the bars today to talk about technical parole violations and the Less Is More campaign. We will see you next month. As always, be safe and remain well. Have a good day. <laughs>